In addition to my online food ordering app, I also developed an in-store point of sale system that works on iPads, Android devices and Windows systems. In this video, I'll be diving into the high-level architecture of this application. But before we do, make sure to subscribe, leave a like and then we're good to go. At the core of our point of sales app sits a Vue single page application. For this application, I still use Vue 2.7 because over the years, our front-end component library grew to a substantial size and it's based on Bootstrap 4. The risk of using Vue 2 in production today is pretty minimal and if you do need the extended support, there are commercially available never-ending support versions. But for my use case, I'm fine with accepting this minimal risk. That being said, for new projects, I usually start with Vue 3 and Tailwind nowadays. As our database, we use IndexedDB with Dexy as a wrapper. This database is pretty lightweight and gets synced with our Laravel backend in the cloud. By default, Dexy uses auto-incrementing primary keys, like in MySQL, but because our point of sales app can be used by multiple waiters at the same time who can each create their own tickets, we had to make use of UUIDs as a primary key. To achieve this, I created my own Dexy plugin that I'll link in the description below. This plugin hooks into the creating hook of a table and will generate a UUID as a primary key whenever we insert a new record. Our view app also connects to a WebSocket server that our Laravel backend uses to dispatch events onto. For example, whenever a new online order gets placed. This way, our point of sales app can register the orders instantly. So far, so good, but this is where things get tricky. Like most point of sale systems, our application is able to print receipts using a receipt printer. We could use WebUSB, my favorite browser API, but since our point of sales app is built to be used mobile, we cannot use USB connections, as the waiters will not walk around the restaurant with a printer tethered to their tablet. Unfortunately, none of these printers have a decent SDK, especially when it comes to wireless communication using JavaScript in the browser. There are some printers that do have an HTTP API, but most of these printers communicate using a low-level TCP protocol. And browsers do not allow direct TCP communication for security reasons. And this is one of the reasons we had to introduce Electron into the mix. The Electron-specific code is super simple. We load our single-page application into the web view and we make use of their auto-update package. Then we have a node component, which I call our low-level gateway. This node gateway creates a WebSocket server and through this WebSocket server we're able to communicate with our TCP printers. I implemented a promise-based pattern that allowed me to await the result of a print command as follows. So I created a WebSocket helper, but for now I will collapse this and let's start with the usage. We create an instance of the WebSocket helper as follows. And then when we open the WebSocket, we can send a print command and await the result. And whenever we get a result, we will log the response. In the constructor of the WebSocket helper, we take a URL and we initialize a WebSocket. Then we will initialize a map where we will store in all requests. Then let's jump to the send method. It takes a command. We will return a new promise. And the first thing we need to do is generate an ID. For example, the current date. We store this ID together with the resolver into the requests map. Then we stringify the message and send it over the socket. At this point, our node gateway is able to communicate with the printer, send the print command, await the response, and then it will send back a message on the WebSocket. And this is where we will handle that message. First thing we'll do is parse the data, and then we will extract the ID and the data from the message. The ID that we get back here must be the exact same one we used to create the request. And that way we can look up the ID in our map. And if we do find a corresponding promise, we will resolve it with the data we received. And then we can print the response. Pretty neat. Next up, the government requires Belgian point of sale system to be registered by law. This means that every single ticket needs to be stored in a thing called a fiscal data module for tax auditability. Unfortunately, this law dates back from a time where internet and mobile devices were not very popular. And the hardware reflects this, as it has no ethernet port, and communication happens over a serial connection. Nowadays, there's a software server that provides an HTTP interface, making things a bit easier, but this HTTP server was never intended to be used from within a browser. Things like cores were unable to be configured, 
and this is why we had to introduce a reverse proxy server within our low-level gateway. This proxy server proxies every request going to the fiscal data module server and adds the necessary headers. Finally, our application also works on mobile devices. But since Electron doesn't support this, we use React Native as a wrapper for our mobile apps. Like Electron, the React Native specific code is pretty minimal and simply loads the single page app into the web view. Contrary to popular belief, React Native itself does not come with a Node.js runtime. What does this mean? For example, you cannot start an express server from within an app. Lucky for us, there's this beautiful project called Node.js Mobile, which is a full-fledged Node.js runtime for iOS and Android apps. When adding Node.js Mobile to an app, you get a Node.js background worker. In this background worker, we run our low-level node gateway that is able to start up a WebSocket server for printer communication and our proxy server for communication with the fiscal data module. And even though Node.js Mobile comes with a small performance penalty on boot and increases the binary size substantially, to me, these are worthwhile trade-offs as this allows me to share around 95% of my entire code base across all of our platforms. And that concludes the video. I hope this overview was helpful and if it was, consider subscribing and don't forget to like this video. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or remarks and I will see you in the next one.